Good evening again here in House Mario nearby the Gutianum and wherever you are. I think we had a little problem with the sound, but now for sure it will be possible for you to hear. We are very glad from the pedagogical section and the general anthroposophical section to have these moments to reflect a little bit and to look to these impulses given by Rudolf Steiner 100 years ago in this conference he held in Arnhem in the Netherlands. And this lecture is also part of a series of lectures, celebrations of an humanistic pedagogy, in which from 1922 we started, uh, from 2022 we started, yeah, looking to these pedagogical impulses he gave in all these courses. And now we are almost finishing this series because he was in Arnhem and after that then he gave one more course in England in Torquay in August. And of course at that moment when these lectures were given in Arnhem it was not clear that it would be just one more course to the educators after that but today, looking back, 100 years after, looking back to this moment, we can also perceive, in a certain way, the urgency of some topics that he brought. And this urgency can remain us very clearly to the urgency, to the educational urgency of the same topics, or many of them today. And also in that sense, is a very important task for the pedagogical section, for the general anthroposophical section, to bring these contents, not looking back, but looking forward to them. What impulses are given there that are speaking to us today in a very existential way, I would say, if we look to our surroundings, also in the schools, if we look to the needs that are there from young people, from the children, from the teachers and the families. Yeah, this course was uh, in a certain sense already scheduled during the Christmas conference. It, uh, it was an invitation by Zeilmanns, Wilhelm Zeilmanns. He asked Rudolf Steiner if he could come to give up open a public pedagogical course there and um, if we look in this very tight time full of a very very increasing activity we can be astonished that there was time for these almost 10 lectures due to very urgent meetings in stuttgart it was not possible to rudolf steiner to arrive on time in the morning of the 17th of uh, July 1924 for the opening lecture and so Zeilmanns needed to give the lecture instead of him because there were very yeah important um, a very important audience also in the educational realm and on the arrival Rudolf Steiner uh, asked him whether the lecture should be made up later and it was not clear, Marie Steiner was against that because Rudolf Steiner was already very, very tired and it was visible. But even so, the response of Simons was it would be good. And so we have all the lectures that were planned at that point. Rudolf Steiner was not alone. Also teachers from the Waldorf School arrived and gave lectures, Dr. Schubert, Hermann van Barawale, and from the Freie School, from the school in Den Haag, also teachers as Tibe and Van Bemelen uh, were there. And together with this pedagogical course, Rudolf Steiner gave three public lectures on the subject of the art of healing, three lectures to the members, which will be the content of the next um, yeah, reflections today in the evening and also two class lessons for the members of the School for Spiritual Science. And after the conference, Rudolf Steiner traveled to The Hague on the 25th of July for a meeting with the teachers of the school there. This is a little bit to have this surrounding of the course. 
ja, in the months before, Rudolf Steiner had already given very important pedagogical lectures, we can say two courses of further education. One was given in Stuttgart in April and the other the next in some days after in Bern. And looking to these courses, we can experience that they are both a presentation of this pedagogical impulse that is now experienced for some years, for five years, since 1919 in Stuttgart in the school and also in the school in Den Haag for a few years. On one hand, a presentation of this pedagogical impulse, but also and always, it is also a further education for teachers. So it is both and some aspects, if we read these courses and also the course in Arnheim, are clearly a presentation for those who want to know about what is it, what is this pedagogical impulse, and other aspects are very clearly a possibility, and I would also say an invitation to deepen certain thoughts, to deepen certain visions on the child, on the world, on the endeavor of educating, and I would like to bring today some of these aspects that are both. At the same time, I would say an explanation that China is given, what is this endeavor of educating and a further education, a ground for the teachers to again go back or go forward to this entirely new perspective on receiving the children and reading in the child, in the concrete situation, what is the pedagogical need to be fulfilled. Yeah, so this uh, course, um, you can find it in, in, in the book. The, the name in English is the pedagogical value of knowledge of the human being and the cultural value of education, and is in JR 310. It's translated into English. And I would like to start, before I go into these different topics, and I will end with the address Rudolf Steiner gave, and I forgot to mention that he gave an address to the younger people, one of these youth addresses, and I will finish with that. I would like to start, before I go into these aspects of the course, saying some words about the moment in which Rudolf Steiner is speaking here. And if we look, it is August 1924, so there are some months of his life, and of course at that point it's not, uh, it's not obvious, but in a certain sense, there is an intensification in his working uh, gesture connected very deeply to motives that if we read his uh, own autobiography, we can see motives that have been there in his own description since the very beginning of his life. And for sure, one of these motives is the question on how a human being enters this life and finds his own path in the meeting of the own intentions and that what comes from the world. If we read the autobiography, we can see that in the very early years, this was, in the description of Rudolf Steiner himself, a question for him. Something was living in this child from inside, also a huge, huge longing to see the world, to go in relation to the world, a huge inner life in the sense of a, a richness in all impressions and at the same time, this curiosity and also this wonder 
what is coming towards him. We can say the two main gestures for incarnation are there as a question. And if we soon go into these topics he is addressing in these lectures, it is about these two streams all the time, and education is the art of making these two streams in relation, of bringing them in relation, or of enabling them to meet in relation. Because this is not something that you can do from outside, but we can foster that this can happen for the children, for the young people. And at the same time, we see there is a very, very cosmic dimension in all this. It is the very concentrated human dimension on one hand. It's this one child. He is addressing all the lectures saying, look to this child. And at the same time, there is a huge, huge time and space dimension, we can say this cosmic dimension of the wholeness of existence that is present in this very concrete moment for the child, for the relation with the teacher and so on. And this huge dimension is present in these lectures to the, given to the teachers and also in the address to the youth. And so these are, so to say, some of the threads I would like to follow a little bit now. In the first lecture given on the 17th of July, not in the morning as it was pretended, but later, he starts speaking about the relation in between love and knowledge. A ground relation. A relation for all teachers in every class. If we don't have this love, if we don't feel this loving connection to the world, to the children, to what we are bringing, then it's empty of sense for them. And he brings that that knowledge and love are intrinsically connected. We could even say maybe for the teacher they are two parts of the same experience. And maybe also for the human being, as human being, in relation to the world, in relation to himself, love and knowledge are not to be separated. And he says, for life, however, love is the first power of cognition. So for life, love is the first power of cognition. As, yeah, we can say, as a condition for learning. It is a learning condition. And then he will say that this love will become a working attitude for the teacher. And that this working attitude will enable the children to learn. So love as a working attitude. And then he goes a little bit further and he will speak about this relation. So it's not an open uh, or a general love. It's always this love related to cognition it's always to, uh, the love to something, to something that maybe we know or to something that we sense we can know. And he says, but all that is only possible if we are interested in the reality. And he says, when the school started, it was necessary to look to the reality, to the reality of the children, of those who were there, and to the reality of the teachers. And he says, one must organize the school in such a way that one does not set up an abstract ideal, but then works out the school from the teachers and from the pupils. And they are not present in an abstract way, but in a very concrete, as very concrete individual entities. 
That is what it is all about. And then one is led to the necessity of building true education, realistic education, on the knowledge of the human nature. So for him, the reality is given, is a given fact. It's not that we want to achieve an ideal of the human being or an ideal of education, but education is always given in time and space. And I want to underline that now very constantly because sometimes also in schools, in, the, in, yeah, in, in talking with teachers, and we feel that also when we are teaching, that we develop in a certain sense images of what should be. And sometimes these images are wonderful. But this is not what he aims the teachers to search for. He aims the teachers to look to the reality of the children. And out of this reality, this earthly reality, this time and space given reality, to then decide what is to be done. And not to persecute images that we develop and in which we try to fit that, what we do in relation to the children. And then he speaks about that this can only be a realization in connection to the world. And we need to know the world, we need to go to the world, and we need to come from the world. He says, the teacher faces the children in such a way that the whole world is revealed to him in the individual child, and not only a human world, but also divine spiritual worlds in earth. And one may say the world reveals itself to the teacher in as many ways as he receives children to care for. He looks to, the, to each child into the great world. His education then becomes an art. His education is based on the awareness that what is done is done directly for the development of the world. Yeah. And then, in the second lecture, he will bring again this thought that the education will become fertilized, will become enriched, will become possible through the knowledge of the human nature. And this knowledge of the human nature is not an image, a theoretical frame for the human nature, but we need to learn aspects to be able to read this human nature. And he will come back then later to that. In the fifth and the sixth lecture, and this too, I want really to underline, he will bring what we can say are the conditions for education to exist. And these conditions are very simple are the reality of the interest of the teacher, that what he will then name the teacher's conference, the teachers in exchange about and for the child, and the other is the realm of the families, is the realm of those who are around, who surrounds the school, we can say, one, he will say, is the heart or the soul of the school. He will call it here the soul of the school. The teacher's conference is the soul of the school. And the other, we can say, is the neighborhood, the warmth, that what protects, what fosters, what enables this soul to be there for the children. And for our 
questions on education today, both are very central topics. He will describe that if we are not ruling education, if we are not guided by rules, by given rules, it could be the rules given by the state, it could be the rules given nowadays, we know from the didactic books, the rules given by programs, by systems, if they are written or if they are in the computer, now it makes for, for this topic not such a difference. Ruled education, if we are not wanting to search for an education that is ruled, that means that is a program, whoever is the child. But if we are searching to find the strength to constitute education not out of systems, then instead of the system, the only way to establish a secure learning realm is this exchange given in this teacher common endeavor of learning. And so this is not something that is in addition to all, in his perspective, in addition to all what the teachers are doing anyway, and then also the teachers' conference, it's the way around. If we really want to constitute an educational environment for the child grounded on the perspective of mutual relation, then the beginning of that is this teacher's meeting, is the realization of a common learning around the child in this community. Yeah, and then he will say that very clearly. In the teachers' conferences, the individual child is discussed in such a way that an attempt is made to grasp the essence of human nature precisely in that particular individuality which is given in this child. In the world of school, the greatest importance is attached to the study of the children in the teachers' conferences, so that the whole teaching staff is always informed about the situation of any given child. And now he is very realistic. He will say, of course, this task is becoming more and more extensive. For the world of school, which was founded a few years ago with about 150 children, now has about 800 pupils in over 20 classes with well over 40 teachers, including all the parallel classes that had to be set up. All this can testify to the fact that the possibility of proceeding, as I have described, is only possible, feasible, if you also develop an eye for which children you have to work with in particular. So, it's not possible to talk about 800 children, but we have the teachers in the classes, and they will bring and then there will be this common awareness around the child in deep respect and always knowing that something holy and untouchable is meant to be in the center of these conversations and that there is always a border that can't be, so to say, um, yeah, overcome. It's always in the deepest, tactful respect. And it's very interesting that after saying that, these teachers around the child, looking to the reality of this child, he brings an example about this interest and the greatest attention, as he says, to the reality of the appearances of the child. And this example is very beautiful, I would say, also in relation to the time in which he is bringing that. And the example is what he experienced as a teacher when he was 21 years old, a teacher in a family. When he was the teacher 
for these children. He was a teacher and a tutor, uh, and he was raising up one child that had particular difficulties in learning, particular difficulties in entering his own earthly existence in his body. And Rudolf Steiner could help this child in such a strong way that he could really overcome his difficulties in learning and he could then develop in a wonderful manner. And uh, the Familie Specht and this child, and he describes that. And he said, and he writes, that, uh, he says then, since I had to teach from the age of 14 or 15 in order to be able to live at all, I always had to give individual lessons. And so I had to acquire this education in direct teaching and in educational practice. And then he says, for example, when I was a very young man of 21, a family entrusted me with the education of four boys. Among them was one. He was 11 years old when I joined the family as a tutor who was hydrocephalic to the highest degree. He had very strange peculiarities. And then Rudolf Steiner describes these peculiarities. He didn't want to eat with all. He wanted to eat apart in a very special way and so on. And the parents were very, very unhappy, he says, and concerned. And then he enters in relation with this child. I will not describe all, and he was also not describing the whole situation, but many aspects. I just want to underline one. Um, and he says, this education had to be carried out in such a way that I sometimes needed two hours to prepare what I wanted to teach the boy in a quarter of an hour. The point was to approach the boy's lessons with the greatest economy and never taking more time for anything than was necessary. And it was also a question of organizing the day with the utmost precision. And so we see this huge preparation out of the interest in observation, observing this child, observing what this child is able to do, how, for how long this child is able to be in concentration, and then to prepare and to take a whole topic in such a way that then in a quarter of hour this child could really stay in relation to that. And I think this is a wonderful example of what he is here trying to say. There is not a program given. It's out of the observation of this child. And of course, then we can say, well, but it was not 40 children in one class. It was one child for sure. But he is just, I would say, um, making visible the, the fact that we can observe and that the observation can lead us to know what should be done. But then we need to prepare. Then we need to go into that and to enable that. Yeah. And then after this, this um, narrative of his own experience, he comes back and he, was, and he says, that the, in the teachers' conferences there is a continuous learning for teachers. He says that the teachers are constantly learning. Thus the conferences become the soul of the whole school, and then one also learns to appreciate the insignificant, in the right way, the little details to access the important things correctly and so on. But he says, we need to know that we will do what is possible. And that is also so beautiful. So he's not speaking about a huge ideal beyond our possibilities. He's saying, no, we need to know, to know and to see what is possible. And he says also in the Waldorf School in Stuttgart, for since one, not, one cannot pay teachers endlessly, 
Not everything can be organized according to this ideal, but only as far as it is possible. And you will not misunderstand me if I say that ideals are useless. Don't say that anthroposophy is not idealistic. We can appreciate ideals, but you can't do anything with ideals. You can't paint them beautifully. You can't say this is how it should be. You can also imagine that you are striving for it. But in reality, you have a very specific, concrete pupil body of 800 children that you have to know and between 40 and 50 teachers that you else also have to know. Yeah, this is school life. And they should allow themselves to affirm that and to joyfully affirm that and not to be all the time this expectation of how it should be because nobody is us we in we would like things to be or people to be or teachers or parents or the colleagues they are there and for this situation in this time today and here we are there for the children and this is the big big question in which extent we affirm that in all the attitudes in education yeah and then the next day 22nd of july in the sixth lecture he will speak about the parents and he says in addition to what i said yesterday about the teachers conferences the soul of the school he repeats i would like to add today before I go any further in the purely methodological discussion, that we, that we must attach the greatest importance to being in complete harmony, in full agreement with the parents of our school children, that we organize parents' evenings at relative short intervals, which are then attended by the parents of the children present in the town, with whom the intentions, the methods and facilities of the school are discussed and generally before the parents meeting of course whose wishes are then also accepted in so far as they can be expressed in a meeting this gives you the opportunity to really work out what is to be achieved pedagogically from the entire social milieu from which it originates in reality as a teacher, you hear what the parents have in mind for the education of their children. In short, we are not only in an abstract dialogue with the parents, but we are in constant contact with them. We have to attach great importance to this, because we have no other connection. In a state school, everything is organized. You know with great certainty what the teaching objectives are. You know that the child has to be so and so, for example. But here, we don't have this rule. This rule um, given structure in the sense that we need to develop what needs to be done in the relation with the environment the families or those who are responsible for the children. And this is something very important, that the pedagogical things should come from the entire social milieu from which it is originate in reality. And I want to underline that because today, 2024, so many times we hear questions also not only in, in Waldorf and Steiner schools, but in general in schools. In a certain sense, the desire that the conditions for education would be different as this that we have. That we would prefer other social relations as those who are given. That Maybe the families could have more time for children, that maybe at home it should be different as it is, and so on, and so on. And so many topics that we are bringing into school because they also should know that and that and that. And here we see it is about the realization of education in the field in which it is happening. 
And in this sense, I want to mention here that in so many schools, the teachers are really looking to that. And we see an unbelievable effort from teachers all around the world in so many schools that I have the joy to, to meet in this, um, in this yeah, last years. And now, specifically, I would love to mention uh, a teacher's meeting uh, a few weeks ago uh, in North America, the North American teachers' meeting, and hearing that what is going in classrooms and in schools, really always connected to the social reality of those who are there, to the families, to those who are enabling the child to come, to the teachers. And it needs so much courage sometimes to face this reality, the social reality, the challenges that are around us. And we can say that also after COVID and all these restrictions, it was not easy to say yes and to say, and we stay with education in this world as it is now, of course, always trying to give the best to make it possible for education to happen. But the children are there, and they are expecting us to be there for them. And Rudolf Steiner is speaking about that, to give the opportunity to really work out what is to be achieved pedagogically from the entire social milieu from which it originates in reality. Big question. Yeah. Um, and then, after speaking about the parents, he will say that it's always a question of the milieu, of what is around, but also of the reality of the moment. And he says that it's not possible to say now what should be done in five years in a school. He says what we do instead of the di directorate is to study and progress through the teachers' conference themselves. This is a spirit that lives as a concrete spirit among the teaching staff, which also works freely and in a creative way. Our teachers cannot know today what will be good in the world of school in five years' time. Our teachers cannot know today what will be good uh, in the world of school in five years' time because they will have learned a great deal in those five years. And then, after five years, they will have to judge what is good and what is not good. Yeah, we need a connection, he says, to the social element that the children have grown out of. We need a close connection to the parents with regard to all the questions that constantly arise when the child is at school. And it is at school that the child comes out of this parental home. Yeah, and then Rudolf Steiner will also speak about this deep relation of the teacher and the world. And he will say something that is so important for teachers also today. We are all overwhelmed by the quantity of things that we want to bring into classroom. And then we accelerate our own learning. And he speaks about that decades before we had the challenges of all these IT questions. But he is, again, speaking about something that today appears in a different way, in an intensificated way, for sure. But the question was already there, and he says, and then the teachers, because they are always preparing for children, or so many times preparing for children, in a certain sense, they start not to go deep into their own knowledge. And that is what makes then the class, the lessons in class very dry and livingness and, and, and without empty of life. If the teacher really studies something, something maybe much more than it will be able to bring, to, he will be able or she will be able to bring to children, then it's full of life. 
And he says that it's also, he says, if we take a teacher, the teacher's conception given by the history textbook, in after a few years of teaching, where he will take the human ideas from. And so always this call to stay learning, to stay learning as an adult, and then to prepare for the child. But we need to learn as adults from the world. And then we are able to transform that artistically to enable the child to read the world. Yeah. And um, he will say again and again how important this learning to observe life is. Learning to see, learning to stay in. He will say, we have to bring the world, the real world, into the school. And to do this, however, a teacher must be inside the world, must have a lively interest in everything that is there in the world. Only when the teacher becomes a human being of the world, the teacher naturally becomes then um, able to bring a living world into the school. The world must live in the school. Even if the world is first expressed in a playful way, and then in an aesthetic way, and then in a preparatory way, but the world must live in the school. It is therefore much more necessary today to emphasize this element of attitude and feeling in modern education that to come up with new methods again and again. And then in the 10th lecture, in the last lecture, this lecture that is given because the first lecture was not possible to be given because he came a little bit too late, he speaks about the development of the school and he speaks that so many things came out from anthroposophy and that the school movement was some or is something deeply connected to anthroposophy and that first he says when he first wrote this little book the education of the child from the point of view of spiritual science it was in the very beginning of the anthroposophical movement and there, with all kinds of instructions, but there was no school movement. And he says there was some mothers asking if should I read, uh, should this child be dressed in blue, should that one be dressed in red, should this one be given a yellow blanket or that a red one. And so he says we are asked what one child should eat and so on. It was a nice endeavor, but it didn't go very far. So, just to know what is good for my little child. It's beautiful, of course, but it was not enough. And then he says, Emil Molt came with the idea of founding a school for the children of the workers of the world of Astoria cigarette factory. And then he says, then it was suddenly possible for that what was developed in anthroposophy to be at service for education. And in his description, which I will not read here um, due to the time, we see this, what I mentioned in the beginning, that everything, in a certain sense, that Rudolf Steiner searched for in this understanding of the spiritual reality on earth of the human being is an educational gesture. We can say, of course, we can, the medicine movement, we have um, the, the agricultural movement and so many transformation impulses given to different fields of the human prof uh, uh, proficiencies and also the fields of, of active endeavor or, or, or encounter with the world, but in essence, in a certain sense, it is a movement of education, of self-education for the grown-up, and of education 
an inherent movement of education because he describes anthroposophy as his endeavor of understanding the human being in loving the, human, the humanity in the human being. And so we see that this educational gesture is kind of a red thread even in the moments in which we would say the topic is not education directly, but it is a, a great joy that in these final years there was a school and there was teachers' conferences. And how many times Rudolf Steiner went to Stuttgart for more difficult or more easier conversations with the teachers and the students and the school environment, a place devoted for education. It is in a certain sense, yeah, on the depth of this gesture in this biography, in a certain sense, at least I see it like that, and reading also his autobiography, and facing now that in March uh, next year, it will be 100 years of his death, so being also aware of this biogra biography in this sense, I would say yes, there is a gesture, an inward gesture of education all this time. And with this inward gesture, I think he also speaks to this youth, this youth address that he gave in Arnhem on the 20th of July, in addition to all other things, he speaks to a group of young people. It's a speech during this anthroposophical pedagogical um, public conference. And this youth speech is very, very special from very different points of view. And I would like just to bring some of the elements of this very short speech, we can say. And he says first that to them that something totally new happened. He says in the depth of the subconscious of the youth, especially since the turn of the century, so from the 19th into the 20th century, young people have had an inner kind of experience through which they show that they feel something is shaking the development of humanity like an earthquake. So something is happening and an earthquake is when the ground is not reliable anymore. When the ground moves, normally we move on the ground. The ground is given to us for us to move. But when the ground moves, we are in a total different relation to the earth. And he says that in the deep, in deep in the soul, there is an experience as something is shaking humanity like an earthquake. Yeah, and then he starts to bring different aspects of this uncertainty and he will say you know I am speaking here in a certain sense indeterminately and that he says is precisely what is necessary in life to speak vague but heard felt if you want to bring to the usual over clarity then you are not in the truth anymore. So it's very interesting with this young people, he speaks about the, yeah, the possibility and also the right to be not maybe so clear, but be grounded on the forces of the heart in a heartfelt way, he says. Yeah, and then he will uh, there say that, I read it, the essential thing is that we have a heart 
for what the other person feels. We will agree on that, we can always agree on that, but that is what needs to be sincerely understood and in this respect it would be necessary for individual young leaders within the youth movement to increase their trust in the sincerity and reliability of the anthroposophical movement. It's very interesting that trust in the sincerity and the reliability of this movement. These young people were deeply interested in anthroposophy, but they were in a certain sense in doubt if their realm for them is this. And then he speaks about a survey that he tried to make, and I would love to say some words about this survey, and I will say also why. And it is a very concrete thing, because this question that he speaks about in this uh, address in Arnhem inspired in 2017 young people in the youth section in such a way that they undertook the task to make a survey and they worked on that for more than four years worldwide talking to other young people asking them a question that should not be a theoretical question to be responded but a, theory, a, a question that should live with them. And it's very beautiful also to say that here because this endeavor of, maybe it's not so clear, but it's heartfelt, that Rudolf Steiner is describing to them, this is something that really can live in the hearts of the youth. And it was very, very strong a very strong experience for more than 130 young people all around the world to really go deep in these questions. And more than this, many, many uh, other young people then connected to these young people also participated on that. And I will read what Rudolf Steiner says at that point. Also, uh, yeah, in, in facing the fact that this, in, this inspired really people so many decades later. So he says, it should not be something pedantic, it should be something that is developed through heartfelt work, through heartfelt understanding between people. Certainly it is a matter of tentative research, of lovingly grasping how young people live today. First of all, we try to put a question to the youth about how they imagine the youth movement so that thoughts should arise, perhaps not thoughts, but rather perhaps fistfuls of feeling, spadefuls of will. Everything could have been included, but nothing came of it. Now I took a sharper approach and have now addressed a question to young people, and maybe you have read it. How do you imagine the world of humanity should be around 1935 if what you longed for in your youth is to have place in it? How do you imagine the world of humanity should be around 1935 if what you longed for in your youth is to have a place in it? This is something that, if you take it seriously, you can think a lot about and feel a lot about. And we can only really make progress if our progress is honest, not phrase like, and that's what matters. Yeah. And so the question was then not anymore, how should the world be in 1935, but what do you think should be there in 2030 so that what lives in you can become a reality? And what will you do to make it possible? A very inspiring question that these young people then developed. And then he will come to the topic of courage. And he says, well, the whole life of the world must be refounded in its grounds. And we can say on one hand, this is true for that point. He's speaking to this youth, 1924 after the, war, the First World War, in a very, very difficult political and economical situation in Europe. 
But at the same time, I think this has a huge validity for the youth also today. For young people entering the world, it is true that life, that the life of the world must be refounded in its grounds. And each new generation is able to refound the life of the world in its grounds. And this is also a gesture of education. Can we foster in school, in school life as teachers, that they can feel, the young people can feel that they are asked. They are asked individually and as a generation, yes, to, to, to put their efforts, their joy in refound the world in its ground. And he will finish, and this will be also my last topic, in a very um, impressive, I would say, way, when he will speak about two huge changes that happened. And one is the sunrise, and the other is the human heart. And he will finish bringing these two huge changes together. He says, the sunrise had changed. And he describes that the flames come out of the glow. And it is not true if someone describes a sunrise for the present day according to the example of Herder or Goethe. It has become different. Then it was smoldering, and today it has become flaming. Out of the flames come the spiritual which prompts us to be active. The spiritual world has taken on a different gesture to the physical world. The sun rays is different. Because the spiritual world has taken on a different gesture to the physical world. So we can't anymore describe the sunrise in the same words as Herder did or Goethe. And then he says, yeah, the hearts have also become something else. If we realize that we have, that we have new hearts, that new hearts must feel the world quite differently from the old hearts, and if we take this very seriously, then the youth movement will become something like a flame that will beat towards the flame of the sunrise. And this is a, yeah, it's a very cosmic and very human image. We see the sunrise, the upcoming sun will meet in its new way, that what lives in the heart, and the hearts feel anew. The hearts feel different. The hearts are different. He says we have new hearts, and the new hearts must feel the world different from the old hearts. And then if we take it seriously, the youth movement will become something like a flame, where the there is a beat of the heart towards the flame of the sunrise. We see this huge image of this reality, of the cosmic reality of light, we can say, coming together as a flame with the reality of the human heart. And he will finish this address saying that the enthusiasm will grow together with spirituality, and he will, the last phrase is, the merging with spirituality will be the full experience of youth. The merging with spirituality, and we see here in his description, is not a spirituality beyond our physical or our earthly or our common social experience, but in the center of this earthly experience. Because it's in the center of the earthly experience to see the sunrise and to feel the heart. Yeah, so I would like to finish with that. This 
image of something new that arises, something new that can be found, that can be searched for. And also in this sense we can read these lectures he gave to the teachers in this course. In a certain sense, all what is going on in the school is deeply connected to these forces of the heart, to this heart that then opens itself to see the sunrise, to see the world. And he gave this very inspirational quotes for the teachers in Arnhem at that point, connected to these other lectures that also brings, in a certain sense, the central question of the spiritual reality. And we will then, after a five minutes break, go to the next lecture, which will be given by Peter Zell. Thank you very much for your attentiveness here in House Marion and wherever you are. Thank you. So good evening again to the second part of these um, considerations and reflections about what, what happened 100 years ago, just in, the, in these days in Arnheim. And for the anthroposophical movement and society and School for Spiritual Science, Arnheim means, signifies something very deep, something very surprising and um, it is not so easy to approach to it, especially to the Kama lectures, because from our perspective now, a lot of you will know all the Kama lectures and the whole full image what Steiner brought about the destiny of the anthroposophical society of the Michael movement and all these topics related. But at the time when he started, there were three lectures about destiny aspects of the anthroposophical society in Arnhem, I would say the culmination of these, of these thoughts, of these perspectives, they were hidden. And it was really in Arnhem when he started uh, to a very different and new approach to the whole Michael mystery. So these three Arnhem lectures, which for us are, as I mentioned now, only a fragment of a broader image, a puzzle element uh, of a broader image. Um, now it is different, difficult to approach to the consciousness of those of those who were there in Arnheim, and for them, it was absolutely new. And I always remember when Sergei Prokofiev told me. He was, um, it was in the winter 1974 to 75, so he was still 20 years old. And because he's born in mid of January uh, 54, uh, it was just, just before his 21st birthday. When he was um, staying with a friend, um, I knew him also quite well. Slava Ivonin on a dacha, Russian dacha near St. Petersburg. He visited Slava and Slava gave, gave him for reading the three Arnheim lectures. And Sergei told me, and he also described it in, a, in an essay, how he was awakened all night because these three lectures they were really directly going to his inner heart. He said, everything becomes clear or became clear. Now I knew the spiritual being to whom I had always wanted to serve. And he said that he tried to unite his own being with what was described in Arnheim as the face of Christ, Michael the inspirer of modern spiritual science. So out of these three lectures, and I think it is not difficult to follow him, if we really start again to read these lectures, but not knowing them before, not knowing them before. And now we have the problem in the general anthroposophical 
society or the movement that everything seems to be known, seems to be known, or let's better say it's familiar. Yeah, we went familiar with it. And now Hegel, Hegel said once how to rec recognize the familiar. Oh, in Deutsch, wie das Bekannte erkannt wird. So we are used to it, used to these images, but how to wake, wake up for them? Again, they, they became, become completely anew. So for the young Prokofiev, he had not this proud image of the Michael movement history, which some of us or most of us can simply have because there are books about it and so on. But at this time in Arnheim, it was anew. And for me, so <laughs> for the reception of Dr. Steiner's work, it is how do we become young again? I mean, not maybe not the young Prokofiev, but in a way, how does this anthroposophical movement becomes young again or develop the capacity to be surprised again, to be touched? And we heard about by the lecture given by Constanza Kalix at the end. So the connection between the sunrise or the different new sunrise and the flame of the human heart. I think that anthroposophy is belonging to this sun rising element, which started at the end of the 19th, but mainly at the beginning of the 20th century, and the resonance in human heart. And now we became familiar with anthroposophy, books and um, structures and uh, conventions and tradition lines. And so what is the connection in between our own hearts if they are still inflamed or how do we develop a capacity to re-inflame the hearts for the new anthroposophy? But I don't think that we have that we, we need new topics in so far that we need new research results in a, in a strict sense, but only this, only this enormous image, research results of Steiner in more than 300, 400 books, how to focus on them that we are not only surprised, but also that we a kind of an inner commitment to this spiritual element. So now it's not so easy to go into these lectures um, from the point of view before. But I will do a little bit in an artificial way, but maybe uh, allowed tonight. So lectures about, I said, the destiny of the anthroposophical society. This is the main topic in Arnheim. It is not about individuals. It is not about who was who. The main question is, where is the anthroposophical society from and for? I mean, this is the basic question for the whole Karma Lecture serial. But in Arnheim, it's, it's coming to the point. At the end of the three lectures, so it is the 18th, 19th and 20th of July. Today it's the 16th. Steiner arrived on the 17th, that means tomorrow, and then the three following days. It's interesting, yeah, the rhythm of time and the place on earth. Now we are not in Arnheim. We asked ourselves, shouldn't we go there and do it there? And we asked also our Netherlandish friends, what is happening there on this sacred place from this point of view? Is there a chance? But obviously they are on holidays, maybe not all of them. But now we are different in, 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 in the relation to space, but we are close to the time. And um, so in Arnheim, the central question was the history of the anthroposophical society. And Steiner said, mm. By these lectures, not only the three ones in Arnheim, which are so close for us now in front of us in a time perspective, but 
the whole range of this karma lectures, he said, the society gains the possibility to see itself as in a world mirror, the anthroposophical society. And also the individual with his karma leading him into the anthroposophical society can also see himself reflected. So it's, it's belonging to all of us. And, um, and even if this was the major topic since month, but in our line it was focused, and you will hear a little bit about it, there is a new impact. And Emil Bock, who was maybe the first one who gave a real lecture about this topic, it was soon after the ending of the Second World War, I mean, four years later, but 49, 1949, Emil Bock gave a wonderful lecture in Stuttgart about the composition of the Karma course Steiner has given. And he said, don't forget, don't, you shouldn't, you, you should see the huge difference before Arnheim and then. So this, this new impact, like a lightning, we and blitz, he said. Um, and also with a new, he said, apocalyptic fighting style. An apocalyptic fighting style. Now we can ask ourselves now, being in Dornach and not being in Arnheim tonight, um, what was before? I wouldn't say what was mid of February when Dr. Steiner started with the karma lectures, but we can pose the question, let's say the karma lectures in July, in Dornach. Because, yeah, and then you can see softly and how to say, with kind of prudence, with kind of attentiveness, Steiner, he, he came nearer and nearer to to the, the central theme. Let's say 1st of July, there was a karma lecture here of Steiner, and the main theme was the struggle for the human intelligence. And also, and then combined to it, the Aristotelian approach, the scholastic approach, and the Arab philosophers. So the age of the coming consciousness cell time and the question, how will the, the intelligence be treated in the future? As an only earthly product or as a heavenly reality or both? And Steiner sketched a little conversation between two Dominicans about this. It's a little bit, hmm, what kind, so yeah, a little bit, it is not a full picture, but an element of it. And I will overjump this very famous lecture about karma questions on the 4th of July. This is very well known in the anthroposophical society because it's about a, the post-mortal development and also especially how the soul and the spirit is received by the hierarchies. And it ends or culminates in a certain, in a certain mantra. And this is still used for our memorial days. But it, it belongs also to the main topic, but I will a little bit ignore it now. I will focus more on the 6th of July. It was a Sunday evening, Schreinerei, carpentry um, building here. Steiner said, now I will start with a shy reverence to talk about the spiritual cosmic basis of the anthroposophical society. And he sketched the situation saying what we see on, human, on earth, that some human beings are attracted by anthroposophy, affinity, kind of a, a driving force, and others not. And why? And, and with this driving force, they also come to the anthroposophical society, may be disappointed or not. But in a way, and the other ones, they, not at all, even if they are interested in general in spirituality or, but the society or let's say this impulse in civilization, it's only interesting, if at all. But some others, they are 
attracted. And what is the basis for this attraction, for this kind of, I have to do, I have to go. And Steiner described, and this is now well known, we are very familiar with this, that Steiner described first time on the 6th of July, 1924, what he called a kind of a, yeah, he said a kind of a cultus, a cultus in the cosmic world, which was um, performed, um, a supersensible cult um, by human cells, not incarnated, that means cosmic, and what they are doing together, weaving cosmic imaginations with the support of the hierarchies and the content of their imaginations were images of the future. Um, and now he said those who are attracted in the anthroposophical society and also those who form this society are people more or less who took part in this cosmic cultus. Of course, this cosmic cultus had its own history. It is not a starting point. It is an after effect of other events. Dr. Steiner is not talking about these events, but it's also a pre-event of the earthly incarnation of the anthroposophical society. So, quite suddenly, but without an apocalyptic fighting uh, style, and now I intensify it. But Steiner is, is very subtle in his description, surprising images, a cosmic cult, but it's just a little bit touched, touched. Um, two days later, on, on Tuesday, so the 8th of July, he came again to the topic and said, yes, and you know Goethe's fairy tale, and some of you will also know my uh, first mystery drama, The Gate of Initiation, it is a kind of an echo of this cosmic cult, a kind of a mirror image. So, yeah, they, 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 they were maybe fascinated by... But, what, what, where is going with this description? And then in the same lecture on the Tuesday of the 8th of July, he described two groups in the anthroposophical movement. Um, at the beginning, it seems to be in the actual anthroposophical society. He said, we have two groups, and for the one group, it is very important that Christ is always in the center. So we are a Christian movement, and... Christ and Christ and, and the other ones, they are more interested in the cosmic spirituality. So they are a little bit skeptical or distant to this Christian element, but there is this cosmic spirituality, which is not a contradiction, but a different priority. So he touched it and he describes it a little bit more than I do. But I will come to Arnheim finally. But first, I will to mention then there was the last uh, Karma lecture in, um, or the last two on on Friday, on Friday 11, and then Sunday 13th of July. He again took it the, the motives, and then is describing suddenly the path to the school of Chartres. This is the main topic of this Sunday evening lecture, lecture on the 13th of July, 24, the School of Chartres. So he described before these little groups of Platonists, um, Platonist-oriented souls, who had another relationship to the Christian stream. They were Christians, but they wanted to discuss or to understand or to approach the the Christianity in the light of Platonism. And the school of Chartres, I make it very short now, is an enormous center then in the 12th century where all these little places of Platonic approach to Christianity is yeah, focused, condensed. So, 
a kind of a Platonist um, perception of the turning point of time. And uh, later, at the beginning of the 13th century, he's describing the focus is no more Chartres, but an Aristotelian approach in the Dominican order. But then, underlining it is not a contradiction, they are in a, in a marvelous cooperation, in full harmony. So, he's, it's a little bit as bringing light to a certain landscape. Sometimes you know this, or it's quite dark or gray, and then the sunlight is coming because there is an opening in the clouds, and then something in the landscape is revealed. Uh, and then maybe the clouds are coming back. So it is bringing the focus uh, to Chartres, but there is no full picture. At least I would say they, they couldn't. It was fascinating, but why, in a way? Why is he bringing that? Um, and then there is a little hint in this last karma lecture before he left. A little hint at the end, they saying about the reality of our time, saying in the anthroposophical society, we have to gather souls. Uh, it's about cooperation because a new spiritual age for the development of the earth has to come. And, and therefore, the cooperation is needed. If not, there is a complete downfall of civilization. But not easy to understand. And then he went away. Not directly to, to uh, Arnheim, but first to Stuttgart. We heard a little bit about these very serious discussions in Stuttgart. In fact, what happened in Stuttgart was a crash down. Um, a dying process of one of the big hopes of the anthroposophical movement that they can finance free spiritual life by economy, by economical endeavors. And the profit of economy is, is enabling institutions for sp free spiritual science, but also a Waldo school. And then what happened, the enterprise is collapsed in the German post-inflation decrease. And Steiner said, we have a kind of a memorial ceremony now, a funeral of our, one of our biggest helps. And now it came to an end. He tried to save the Waldorf School. He couldn't save the Stuttgart Clinic for anthroposophical medicine. It, it died. So it was very hard for him. And when he came to late, as we heard, to Arnheim, something happened in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, we heard about the beginning. But I will want to focus. Um, maybe I should mention that also on the Saturday, before he left Dornach, on the Sunday evening was the last lecture. On Monday, he went to Stuttgart. But on Saturday, in the evening, there was no karma lecture, there was the 18th class lesson, not the 19th. It was almost completed, but the 19th was only when he, 2nd of August. So there was quite a long time to wait. And you know, maybe some of you know the 18th class lesson, what is there what is inside this lesson. And he came to that point and then he went. He went to the Netherlands and yeah. So the, I want to focus on the three karma lectures. Interesting, a building called Musis Sacrum. Um, this is a Concertgebouw, but not the one in Amsterdam, but a building for music in out of the middle of the 19th century in the city of Arnhem. And there in the evenings were this Friday, Saturday and Sunday karma lectures. At the beginning, he touched, he touched the Christmas conference. 
because it, he always did when he came to other places, and sometimes he did the same in Donach. Don't forget what happened during the Christmas conference. And then recapitulating what is and what was anew. And in Anna, I only summarize in, in two sentences, there is also underlining the enormous risk of the Christmas conference that the higher hierarchies had an option to to distance from what is going on there in the Christmas conference and the and following, but the opposite happened. Grace and more support even from the highest hierarchies for this kind of anthroposophical movement or Steiner's own research teaching activities. But, and this is also first time said, this is first time said in Arnheim, because he mentioned this kind of uh, positive resonance in Paris in May, and so for Ita Wegmann this was not a new, and for Willem Salmans. They have been in, in Paris when Dr. Steiner said first time very clearly in, in May in Paris, it was well received from the spiritual world. Um, and uh, this risk of the Christmas conference. But what was anew in Arnheim in the first lecture that he said, but there was given a promise to the spiritual world that will be fulfilled in an unbreakable manner. He did not say what kind of promise. It is in a way clear that he promised something, but what exactly? And that it will be fulfilled in an unbreakable manner. What does it mean? So very serious tone, an enormous responsibility, and yeah. And more or less, to come back to my main theme, then he started the lecture with these cultists. So he took it over the motif which came first on the 6th of July, and now we are in the, seven, in the 18th of July, 12 days later, in Arnheim, he's describing this cultus. Um, and he's first time saying the content, the main content of this cultus was the new Christianity. It was an enormous spiritual celebration, he said, over decades. In fact, it started at the, the end of the 18th century, over four decades in the spiritual world. Um, and what later became anthroposophical teachings, what later became anthroposophical activities, was foreshadowed in a world of pure imaginations. So this is a little bit more in detail than in Dornach, but what was completely new was what, what he said then, in, in, in the kind of a direct um, turning to the audience, saying, in this great multitude of souls gathered there in the spiritual world performing the cultus, in this great multitude of souls was a large part of those who today, having descended to earth again, unite in the anthroposophical society. Those who feel today the urge to unite in the anthroposophical society were together at the beginning of the 19th century in the supersensible regions to practice that mighty imaginative cult of which I have spoken. He did not say you, but of course they were all members of this anthroposophical society. And so in Dornach it could have been a wonderful image, but now I'm talking about you more or less. And in the next quotation, um, this, this last quotation was from the second day in Arnheim, from, from the second lecture, but from the first lecture of Karma Issues, 
the following quotation. I would like to say that the vast majority of anthroposophists sitting together could, if they could see through this fact, see to each other and say, yes, we know each other. We have been together in spiritual worlds and have had powerful cosmic imaginations together in a clear cultus. I don't, th I don't think that they had courage enough to turn to the neighbor. Um, but in a way, it's a kind of a, you should do, to turn around, sitting together. And, but if they could see through, he said, that they would realize that we know each other. But maybe you can say this is the only intensification because it, it, indirectly he has said this in Dornach as well. Indirectly. But now it's becoming clearer. But what was also then new, not only by the tone, but by the content, that now Michael and the Michael stream or Michael current or Michael impulse, this was the main subject. Because he's saying, what they did there in this cultus was only a preparing the Michael stream to come, the Michael spiritual impulse to come, the Michael event to come. And what does this mean, a Michael time to come? And in, in, in Arnheim he said this means a lot. One aspect is, and this is typical for the Michael times in general, that what is most valuable in culture and focused on a little spot has to, pro has to, has to, must have been brought or must be brought to the whole world. So the cosmopolitan spreading out and his example was Alexander and Alexandria so that he founded north of Egypt, a center for spirituality, but not in Macedonian. But of course, Alexander went far beyond to the east. But Alexandria and the library of Alexandria was one of these centers. So, but this was 400 years before Christ. But now, in the Michael age, we have to bring out what is the most spiritual valuable of our time. And he focused on the being of Michael. Of course, you can say Michael was no new subject in the anthroposophical movement. I mean, if you consider the lecture course he gave in 1919. But now, Michael enters the Kama lectures. And indeed, if you study all the Kama lectures from 16th of February till Arnhem, 18th of July, there's not a lot about Michael, almost nothing. But now, with the full power, we can all, all maybe say it is there. And descriptions out of the perspective of Michael also. You know it, we know it all from, let's say, the leading thoughts that Steiner was describing not only Michael, but Michael's situation in the cosmos from his inner perception, Michael's inner situation. So maybe you can ask, who is Steiner to describe Michael's inner situation? So, but the problem is that we got familiar with the leading thoughts. So we heard about it. But here the challenge is, that these words are new, suddenly. That he, des he describes Michael, and it is also different from the lecture course from 1919. It's very interesting about the Michael age and the Michael forces, but now it's the being of Michael. He was the spirit, he said, Michael in the past. Um, who not only sent the physical etheric rays of the sun from the sun, but who also sent the inspiring intellectuality to earth in the physical etheric rays of the sun. So, 
the rays of the sun. It's a part, it is an element of the 17 class lecture, 17 class lecture, but now we are here in B and D 18. So the, not only the sun, but the physical etheric rays from the stars and mainly here the sun, but inside, what is inside? And he said in former times, inside was cosmic intellectuality governed or reigned by Michael from our, he said, our consecrated sun place or better sun sphere. So the power of intelligence as a gift from heaven and it reached before Christ's turning point of time the mystery sides of mankind. So the cosmic intelligence was grasped in the mystery sides of mankind, especially in the so-called solar mystery sides, and then inspired their people. Michael is not, I quote, the spirit who cultivates intellectuality, but everything that he gives as spirituality wants to illuminate mankind in the form of ideas, in the form of thoughts, but in the form of ideas and thoughts that grasp the spiritual. Michael wants man to be a free being who also recognizes in his concepts and ideas what is revealed to him from the spiritual worlds. And then he's describing, and it was the first time I saw it again, also saying Arnheim means something in the anthroposophical movement. And I think I've never been to Musi Sagra and they changed the building quite a lot. I can see the, I saw it in the internet. And, but I think the places on earth where such wisdom was developed, brought for the first time. They are for our anthroposophical society and movement important places. One old anthroposophist said once to me that anthroposophists are responsible in their place what was brought by Steiner there. I don't know if this is true, if the Bern people are, the Bern anthroposophists are especially responsible for what Steiner has brought in Bern. But it's, it's in general an interesting thought that a lot of old anthroposophists and branches, they felt in a way closer responsibility for what was brought in their city, locally. Of course, the Dornach people have a big problem in what he brought all in Dornach. But some other places, they have smaller amounts of wisdom grace and gifts. But an interesting thought, I would say, this question of responsibility, and responsibility begins with knowing. And of course the experts, what Steiner brought in Berlin, were in the past the Berlin anthroposophists. This is no more the case, as I know from experience. And in a way, this is loosened, and maybe it's good because we're living in a, in a time where anthroposophy and the lectures are spread out in the world. They don't belong to anybody. There is no private property, also no private branch property. This is also good. But on another side, I ask sometimes myself how to cultivate this responsibility. I wouldn't say local responsibility, but this awareness of time and space, because from a Christological point of view, it is the planet of Christ. That means it's imbued by spirituality. We know from Steiner's teaching, also imbued by evil forces. So maybe it is, it is important that he brought it in Arnheim and not in Stuttgart. At least we should be aware of it. I don't want to overinterpret and I don't want to make a big thing out of it and I don't want to blame the Netherlands friends who are on holidays now instead of, <laughs> instead of being in Arnheim. Um, so we should, uh, in Steiner's way, handle it with humor 
and light and but also yeah it is a serious topic so i sometimes tonight i will mention it saying it is new what he brought and it was new in arnheim when he described what happened to michael and those around him at a turning point of time this as far as i can see never before this question was posed in one of the lectures of Dr. Steiner. The turning point of time, yes, but from the perspective of Michael in the sun sphere, because that's what he's saying. Michael was gathered or was located more or less in the sun sphere, but he was not alone, but gathered <coughs> around him Michael, Michael und die Seinen, he said in German. Michael and his own. <clears throat> Angeloi, arch Angeloi, human cells. He once, in Arnheim, he says, human cells, cells as Angeloi servants around Michael. Michael's Strahlenkleid in the last verse. They were around him and Christ left. The experience was he goes away. He goes away and connect himself with the earth development. A huge experience. He goes away. And they had to realize Christ has gone and not only for a certain time, but yes, he keeps the relationship to the earth. And Steiner described in Arnheim, this was a point and a sign for Michael that he had to come to an own decision. And the decision was that the heavenly intelligence, he, Michael, had preserved until that time now would to have to stream down to earth to follow Christ. And then he said in Arnheim, as a holy rain, an heiliger Regen, so to speak. So human cells were there. And even if he doesn't say it by the names, but by describing the streams, we can say that the leading individualities of the Michael age four centuries before, so let's call Aristotle and Alexander and the surrounding, they were part of this Michael surrounding gathering in the cell. They were not on earth. He's saying that the major part of this stream perceive the turning point of time and the event of Golgotha from the sun perspective and stayed there for quite a long time. Others, Incanites in the first Christian centuries, others of these cells who have a stronger relationship to Michael as well, they go earlier so they perceive early Christianity on earth, but others remain and wait until the 8th, 9th century. And they have different relationship to Christianity and to the development. And he's describing a little bit more in detail than the forerunners of what culminated then in the school of Chartres. But then he came back to Chartres, and so it is the same topic and partly a same, the same description, but, um, but it's become clearer the image and more intensified in Arnim. Um, let's say the sentence when Dr. Steiner described in Arnheim, and this was not possible in Dornach at this time, as if Plato interpreting Christianity had personally worked among the teachers of the school of Chartres. So they spoke there, 
they taught the spiritual content of Christianity. So as if Plato, interpreting Christianity, had personally worked among those leading teachers. As if, he did not say Plato did, but as if. And then he came first time to some of the innermost teachings um, of the school of Chartres, and maybe very astonishing at this point that he said, and he localized it in two teachers, Bernardo Silvestros and Alanus of Insulis, said they had a clear view to the next Michael age, which will start in 1879. So this is, yeah, more than 600, later, 600 years later, they had, they had a perspective when the next time Michael will be the leading spirit of the time. And they taught it, not in the public, maybe not to all of the pupils, but he said to their initiated disciples. And now, because I also did some studies on the school of Charter following Roland Halfen, it is interesting that some of the memories of the 13th century original writings, they really describe also letters. They are existing letters from the 13th century of Chartres that in the evenings they had little gatherings, the teachers and some of the, some of the pupils. So there were little groups as well. Seiner so said initiated disciples or at least a little bit a, an intimate sphere and and Steiner said it was not only this teaching that Michael will come, but it was the teaching of the future destiny of human intelligence. And he said that Bernardo Silvestris and Alano Sabinsulis, they taught, obviously they had a close affinity to Platonism and to this kind of seeing, um, or how to say, this kind of a Platonic mystery approach to world and human being, but they had also a, a perception that the Aristotelian approach is also necessary. And that after their school of Chartres, there will be coming a next epoch, and this will be dominated by the as Aristotelian cells, what Steiner described first time, as far as I can see, 6th of July in Dornach, but he came back to it. And now he is not only describing it, but he is bringing it as a content of this teaching of Silvestris or Alanus, that he said to the, te to the pupils, we must enter into an alliance with the Aristotelians who are to bring into humanity the intellect, which is then to be spiritualized. And in the 20th century to shine forth among men in a new spiritual way. So it is part of a teaching, and the teaching is directed to the 20th century. And the need for intellect, but then spiritualized intellect, and, and a knowing, Steiner said, that it's all a preparation for Michael to come. So the one thing is that Michael will be the leading spirit of the earth again, from 1879 on, but what kind of preparation in human cells are needed? And then he said, <laughs> Alanus Ab Insuli said, there will be difficult centuries coming with the natural science, let's say from the, the worldview. They will teach that the sun is in the center, and they will teach a kind of a, an image of the cosmos which is purely mathematical, only lines and forces. No more spiritual will be in this cosmic image. But this is necessary. It will be wasteland coming. In this, what we call the Copernican system, only mathematical lines will survive. But this is kind then of a basement. 
And then on this ground, there will come then the new Michael impact. Yeah, Steiner said this, there was something magical about the school of Chartres when Alanus of Abinsulis taught something like this to just a few pupils. But it was as if the ethereal world all around had been caught up in the waves of this powerful Michael teachings. So locally only, uh, we, now we are here one, two, three, locally only a little group, he said, in Chartres the same, and we have really letters where it said there was seven pupils in Chartres, <coughs> no big audience, and now live, no live stream, only local, real, but he said spiritually it went out. It went out etherical streams, radiation in the spiritual atmosphere, and then he's describing, I will summarize, how it touched, let's say, a university as Orléans, or a Nebbi as Cluny, or most famous of his examples, the teacher of Dante, Brunetto Latini, who inspired his pupil Dante for what we know as the Divina Commedia, which this enormous picture of cosmos, spirituality, Steiner said it's one of the last, um, how to say, reflections or effects of this, what came out of Chartres. So, the image became more clear from the Michael stream, the sun sphere, but also the school of Chartres, but not finished yet. And also saying, not only, that's what he said in Dornach, there was a kind of school of Chartres and then the Aristotelian 13th century, but now he said, and in Dornach he said on the 6th of July they worked together, but now he said they had a kind of a, a concilium in heaven when the last big of these um, teachers of Chartres left, so at the beginning of the 13th century, and the coming big masters, Thomas of Aquinas, was incarnating just before they met and discussed, or maybe no discussion, but a kind of spiritual conversation. And uh, they came to a kind, great celestial treaty, <laughs> ein himmlischer Vertrag in German, a kind of a commitment to work together and to fulfill the aims now in the 13th century, but from then on till this, and from then on then, from the beginning at the dawn of Michael age. And now then the leadership in the Dominicans on earth with this responsibility for intelligence, originally heavenly intelligence, earthly intelligence, preparation of consciousness soul, and so on. And then they died and went away. It's interesting that the Dominican order, we know about Thomas of Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, and, but it's interesting how short the time was of this enormous quality of the Dominicans. So, I mean, half a we can study it, let's say, also with Meister Eckert or Johannes Tauler. It was a quite an interesting, very fast decline. I mean, they still had their wonderful cathedrals, and, but it was fast. And those spirits, they prepared ground. They did a lot, but then they left and went back in the sphere of Michael. But what was happening there? And Steiner said, for Michael himself as a being, he couldn't act on earth. He was free from, since long time already, from earthly matters. But what now? And now, this quotation, and so it came about that Michael said to his own, Susan Seinen, 
it is necessary that for the time in which we cannot send impulses to the earth, we look for a special task within the solar region. Quite funny, I mean not funny, but that Steiner quote more or less Michael to, to talk to the Strahlenkleid, to those human cells around him. And then he was forming, shaping a Michael school. And this was a school Steiner said for teaching, as a school is usually for teachers and pupils. And what he taught was the ancient mysteries. But now, now adapted to intelligent consciousness. So in a way, ripe for the coming time, an enormous schooling but it was not only schooling, Steiner said, it was a training for working out the karma. He said never before in mankind history was such a preparing karma working unit school in the sun sphere. Human beings since long time passed the sun sphere after death, long time after death, and work or yeah, being part of their future developments of destiny. But here was a school. It was not only individual karma, it was a karma of a group, he said, more or less. And they worked out their karma as never before. And the end result of this school, it's good if school sometimes has a result. And he said the re end result was an urge for anthroposophy. Ein Drang zur Anthroposophie in German. So a kind of, but it belongs to the dramatic um, apocalyptic style in, in, in Arnhem. So it was, this is from the, the third lecture, uh, that it's not only the sun school, but there's a counter school on earth. Now we are all used to this, but this was a new Steiner described an Arimanic school um, under the surface of the earth. Because he said these Arimanic demons, they realized what was going on in the sun sphere. I mean, at, the, at this time it was without any effect on earth. It was only preparing. Preparing for, yeah, the school started in the 15th century, Steiner said, so preparing for 400 years later. But they were, they got restlessness, that Dr. Steiner said, the Arimanic demons, terrible, agitated. And they developed their own school, their own school. And, but this school was already acting and bringing impulses to civilization, not waiting for the Michael age. They, they did not have to wait. So they had an enormous time benefit in advance. And this made, an, as I said, an uncanny, um, yeah, unheimliche atmosphere for those who were very sensitive on Earth that only the impulses, the Arimanic impulses came, and the other one not yet. This abandonment of mankind by the Michael rule and these impulses rising from below with demonic spiritual thinness, which want to conquer the intelligence, because this was the main focus, intelligence. It was not already, as it is now partly, digital intelligence, artificial. But it is how to grasp intelligence, the intelligent forces. So a dramatic apocalyptic image. And now for people who like books, book printing and book reading, it's a little bit surprising in a negative way that Steiner is saying that the invention of the European book presses, starting with Gutenberg in the 15th century, is a result of this demonic Arimanic school. 
we are deeply touched by this um, astonishing thing that Steiner said, yeah, we have to recognize it is not the invention of books. I just want to remind you the library of Alexandria was without Gutenberg. And we had also a very nice library in Reichenau. Maybe you know this little spiritual island on the lake of Bodensee. Uh, they had the most famous and the biggest library in the 9th century, let's say, or 8th century, 400 books. So, but what kind of books? Yes, all like this. So Zana is not uh, fighting against books. I mean, he loved books a lot. But he said that this kind, this type of art of printing with a, what we call movable type, bewegliche Type, also so how Gutenberg did it, became an instrument, an instrument which we know now very good uh, of, of, of bringing interpretations, things in the world, messages and um, also ideology um, with an enormous speedy possibility. Think of the mass media, now they have no more they don't need to print anymore, but it is interesting. The first world war was the first world war which worked by mass media. So it was radio, but it was also a lot of postcards and newspapers and this whole propaganda. It was not possible in the 19th century in this way to get people or to get their intellectuality in so far, Dr. Steiner said there was an admission of Michael. In Anaheim, he said there was an admission of Michael to his Strahlenkleid. When you come down to earth again to carry out what is planned here, then gather the people around you and proclaim the most important things from mouth to ear. And I, you all know how Steiner worked as a teacher from mouth to ear. I mean, we have some books by Steiner, but the books are a little minority from what he did. And these were lectures that they, at the, at the end, stenographed and typed the lecture it was not at all his intention. He accepted and we are glad, partly. But clear is what, what he tried is to follow Michael. Um, but typical Steiner, then he said in Arnheim, please, my dear anthroposophical friends, don't now destroy our literature. Please do not hand over the art of printing to Arima. And then a very interesting sense, he said, if we do this, if we now abolish, if we now go away from printing, he said, this would make the, continu the continuation of the anthroposophical work impossible. So we need printing, he said. And what we do, what we should do now is to ennoble the art of printing through a holy attitude toward the wisdom of Michael to ennoble, to, yeah, in a kind of spiritual, but, but also adoration, this kind of, what is a book, especially an anthroposophical book, and anthroposophical sounds, so it's our book, but now a book related to the Michael wisdom, a holy attitude. So he designed a little bit the Michael school. He started with the cultus. And then he went back to the turning point of time. And then he went to Chartres and to the Dominicans and then to the school of Michael and the Arimani Kauta school. And yes, and the perspective. And the perspective was clear. It is the onset of the Michael age after 1879, 
and the need for a cooperation of the Aristotelian spiritualized intelligence and the Platonic element. And then it's clear from Steiner's description in Arnheim and Aposophy has to start uh, on the dawn of the Michael age with the Aristotelian element of spiritual intelligence because it's a kind of a battlefield sounds so military uh, touched but it is, has to do opening the way for new thinking and if we think on Steiner's first books Aristotelian or maybe he would say Christianized Aristotelian approach to this kind of the dignity of intelligence and also freedom. Um, but this is important is that to open the gate in a new scientific thinking but then more and more we need the platonic elements and then, and this is also the first time that he made it clear what he said here in Dornach, a little bit hidden, that we need to work together and then there will be a kind of a decision. But in Arnheim it is the first time clearly said that at the end of the 20th century there will be the culmination and the decision. And he described in Arnheim first time as far as I can see that of course those who were the first with this Aristotelian approach, they will die maybe in the 20s, in the 30s, but they have a chance to come back earlier, much more early than in the human, in the, in the human condition in general it is meant to be, and to reunite with the coming teachers of Chartres. So this perspective that first the Aristotelian group and second the Platonic, so just the opposite from the Middle Age, but third then to come together because the Aristotelian, they prepared the ground, they knew what to do and then they can come back. Yeah, and he said we have to prepare this and this will be the decision, because if this fails, then there will be the decline of the civilization. And it's up to our free will. He's not saying it's a natural law. It is dependent on what human beings do now with anthroposophy. If this can happen at the end of the 20th century, or starts at the end of the 20th century, and, and then he's talking about preparing by the right way to handle anthroposophy in the anthroposophical society, to cultivate a Michael wisdom in a, in a good sense. I would say in the sense of the leading thoughts, in the sense of what later edited by Mary Steiner under the title Letters to the Members. So this, he said, in Arnheim, he said, we need this mixture of devotion, holy enthous enthusiasm, so close to the youth address and vigilance against Ariman. So this attentiveness and, and then we can prepare. He ended, and I will end as well now, um, he ended the second lecture, so the, the Saturday lecture, with these very famous, quite often quoted sentences. I also quoted these sentences in some of my <laughs> writings, so very popular but interesting. Sometimes I also forget where are they out of. Because if you, know, if you love quotations from Steiner, they are free floating. But suddenly you realize, oh, it is first set on this 18th of July in Arnheim. These sentences, more than any other struggle, this struggle the destiny of human intelligence is embedded in the human heart. It has been anchored in there since the last third of the 19th century. What must be decided in what human hearts do with this Michael matter of the world in the course of the 20th century. And in the course of this 20th century, 
when the first century after the end of Kali Yuga, of the dark time, will have passed, mankind will either stand at the grave of all civilization or at the beginning of that age where in the souls of men who combine intelligence with spirituality in their hearts, the Michael battle will be fought out in favor of the Michael impulse. So this was the end, more or less, of the Saturday lecture. And on Sunday, only one sentence, but this is the real end of the third lecture. Hearts miss, must become Michael's helpers in the conquest of the intelligence that has fallen from heaven to earth. So, Michael, help us. Human beings have to become Michael, help us. What we don't know is what we de devil developed then on Tuesday and Wednesday evening in the class lessons, because they are not stenographed or not found until now. So two class lessons, also in our name, some days later, and 85 new blue cards signed in those days by Steiner for those friends, uh, Netherlandish friends, who wanted to join the School for Spiritual Science. So I hope that both lectures together tonight, 16th of July, and 17 in the morning, the conference started, so we prepared it again from a point of memorizing. Übergeist um, erinnern, behold. Yeah, I hope that both lectures, starting with education, self education, hard education, the sunrise of civilization, the Michael H and the destiny aspect. I hope and I felt it, it's belonging together. And so we, from the general anthroposophical section and the pedagogical section, we didn't want to ignore. In the course of this year 24, even if we had many other lectures and conferences and a lot of people they can't hear any more hundred years, but from a spiritual point of view, it is not a question what we like to have, what we want to hear, or if we think it's enough of 100 years. In reality, we are incarnated now. And this time rhythm, it is so real as, as places are real. And in so far, it was wonderful to be tonight in the house of Edith Merriam, um, Steiner's co-worker for the sculpture for the mankind and being here locally and hopefully also connected to the world and I think we tried our best not to forget Arnheim and especially to bring this impulse back to our hearts and maybe it will have a, it has a chance to become completely anew, even if it is we are familiar to it. But this waking up procedure, I think this is one of the basic preconditions for the School for Spiritual Science to wake up for what is, what is called to be known, but what is really the wisdom and the challenge of the coming time. So thanks a lot to be with us tonight and hopefully Arnheim will start again tomorrow morning. Thank you.